All right. So the next bit of threat hunting with Splunk starts down here. Okay, we found the staging server IP. Um, we already I already showed you how to do that last time. You can just find the request that host the downloaded that poison ivy file and its um, source IP, um, its destination IP. Its source IP is the web server. So here's the IP address of the staging server used to host the malicious image. So I'll copy that. All right. Now I want to find other IP addresses, other domain names tied to that. And here you just use normal threat intelligence. You can just find it on Google. If you Google a malicious IP address like this one, then you will find open source threat intelligence. Uh, and you see Alien Vault has one, Threat Cloud, Threat Miner, and there's a lot of them. Rob Techs. There's a bunch of open source uh, various security companies place information about known attackers on the web. And you can learn more about it. So if you go to one of these, I think just the first one will work. It will give you the history of this. And so this is an Amazon server. And it has three top-level domains. Here's the other domain, WayneCoreInc.com. Um, and here's just an Amazon one. Uh, here is a LeetSpeak domain name with the letter, numbers used instead of letters. Uh, this is what they're looking for. There is a another domain. What happens, of course, is bad guys will hack or purchase a server and then they will use it for many campaigns with many names so it will get a bad reputation and these will have the previous um, domain names it's used so here's another domain name used by them in Leet speak with letters numbers used instead of letters and that's the next flag which connects them to other campaigns and other domain names that might point to the same information so now let's find out more how they gained code execution on our server there was a brute force attack against our server. So let's find it. We're going to look at the POST method for starters. So we'll start with HTTP and restrict ourselves to the POST method. So up here, I've got my HTTP right here. So I'm going to go back to uh, event sampling to make my queries faster. And here I've got HTTP events. I don't want to fruit from that client IP anymore. Let's just start with all the HTTP events. Now, the HTTP method is going to be a field over here. There it is. And the most common methods are, of course, post and get. And when you're logging in, you typically use a post event. So I only want to look at the post events. That's usually how you send a name and password up to a server to log in. So I'm seeing some of them. All right. Now, find all the post events, and I'm going to exclude the events from the vulnerability scanner. A whole lot of these events, I know, come from the Akinetics vulnerability scanner. To exclude something, you just use the capital word NOT. And then I can just put in a word. And this is another example of the way I like to use Splunk, the sleazy way, like the same way you'd use Google. This is just going to not include any event that has this word anywhere in the event. I don't really know what field to look in. I could probably be classier and look for that event in the uh, header fields of the HTTP request, but I don't care. This will exclude the events from the vulnerability scanner. So I had 14. Now I have zero because I'm using sampling. So if I turn off the sampling, now I'm going to get only 441 events. So that is a small number I'm getting somewhere. Now, I want to look at the form data of those events. If I go down here and look at form data, it's EF. This one doesn't seem to have form data. Uh, let's see if this one does. Let's see if I can find it over here. There it is in there. I don't know why I'm not seeing it. Here's the sign of things you see in form data. So there's various different things in there but it's probably more useful information. Anyway, if you want to examine just one field, which is what I want to do, what's more convenient is to make a table out of it. And here's the syntax for that. You put in pipe, table, time, comma, form data. The underscore for time is the automatically generated timestamp field. So if I do that, now instead of giving me everything about the events, it just gives me a table 
with these two things, the time and the form data. And now I can look through these in a nice table. So these first few just look like random stuff. I'm going to uh, arrange my browser to fit on the screen better. And uh, if I get to the bottom, I should be able to change the number of events on the screen. Uh, here they are, 20 per page. I want to go to 50 per page. So now if I scroll down through the first few, look like junk. But down here, here's where I'm starting to see username equals admin, uh, password equals pussy, username equals admin, password, um, password equals Batman, username equals admin, password equals rock, username is admin, password equals cool. This is the brute force attack. Always the username is admin and a whole bunch of passwords come by. So a lot of these events are a brute force attack. Now there were some other events, extra ones, so I'd like to just get the ones in the brute force attack. So I'm going to choose some strings to identify it. And one thing would be username equals admin. And another thing would be PASSWD equals. So if I add those to my query, I'll get rid of the other events. So it'd be username, quote, uh, username equals admin and password equals. I just look for events that contain those strings. Now when I search, I only have 413 events. Now they're all the same. I see the passwords here. Uh, Pussy, this one has Batman over there, this one has Rock, You, Cool, Sammy, August, and so on. And notice the time here. Um, if I sort by time here, this is going to be going forward. Now I have 21.2 seconds, 21.242425256. These are about a hundredth of a second apart. So this is an automated scan. That password, then another password. Um, here, password let me in at the end there. Password QWERTY, 1234. Many, many guesses per second. This is a brute force attack. There's a script running all these events really fast. So I can see the timing of it, and I can see the script running. And if I go down to the end of the script's run, I will see um, it tries this password and that password. And then at the very end, um, it has these passwords are coming in at the rate of many per second. Here's 51.1, 51.1, 51.3. Then there's a gap of about two minutes here, from 46 to 48. What happened is the attacker ran an automated script to try hundreds of passwords, and one of them worked. And then, two minutes later, they logged in manually using the password, which is why this one has a different layout of the password. This is coming in through a real browser. And you can see that another way. If you go back, get rid of the table now, and look at the raw data, you can look at the user agent. HTTP user agent here, and you can see a Python script did 412 events, and then one event came in from the browser. So this is the automated Python scanner, and then this is the administrator logging in after the fact to uh, use the password that was found to be the correct password. And there's a whole bunch of flags there. Um, you'll uh, There's the brute force attack here. So you'll find the IP address performing the attack. And if you go down here, there's more about the brute force. What was the first brute force password used? What was the correct password? And what was the time interval between the brute force, the time it identified the correct password and the compromised login? And how many unique passwords were attempted in the brute force attack? So a whole bunch of flags you can find from that information. So let me stop this video.